welcome, welcome, uh, one and all. It's uh, 7 o'clock or 7.01, so we're going to get started here. Um, so um, please get comfortable and have a seat and um, gather your thoughts. So this is um, Wednesday, September 4th in 2024, and this is um, a select board informational public meeting, but we're still going to conform to the open meeting laws because the three of us are meeting together here. And so we have posted the agenda for this meeting in three places and on the town website and emailed interested parties so we can legally um, go forth. I'm going to act as the moderator, so I figured I should wear, oh, I'm not the only one wearing a mask. I'm, I feel fine. I was just near someone who had COVID, so I thought I would just, um, you know, just for the old time's sake, wear a mask. <laughs> Um, so we uh, basically know what this is, um, what this is about, and we just want to learn more what this is about. The uh, the option that the town has to spend a dollar to buy the the building that we're sitting in, and um, we're coming up on a vote, which is actually going to be on November fifth with um, the bigger vote, and we figured that way it will get the most um, attention and um, participation, and. We have um, several people here with um, the ever-increasing information about what could possibly happen with this building afterwards, but I would like to make clear from the start that the vote is very specifically a yes or no whether or not the town should buy the building. And that basically will take the responsibility for what happens with this building and put it in the town's hands and out of the supervisory union's hands, because right now we have no say over this building. So what happens with it afterwards? There's been a lot of work um, in, in terms of what could happen and a lot of questions and a lot of information, but the vote is not saying that's what's gonna happen. The vote is the first step towards that potentially happening. So I just wanna make that clear from the beginning. Um, so who is, um, uh, Vic, would you like to open up? Good evening, everybody, and welcome. It's gratifying to see so many people present uh, and interested in this topic. And um, if I could get the next slide, Sue. Oh, OK. Um, can you let me get that? So I'm going to do a share screen um, for the folks on Zoom. Give me okay. just a second. Sorry. We'll just pause for a minute. Yeah, I didn't know if you were starting this right now or what we were doing. We're starting. All right, so hopefully everybody on Zoom can see this. Uh, how can I tell if you can? Hopefully I, you can. Um, can someone just like unmute for two seconds and let me know? Looks like maybe Amy. We can see it. Awesome, cool. We can see it. All right, super. <laughs> good. We're good to go. Let's okay, go. great. So first to start with the uh, agenda. Uh, Dune already gave a little introduction about what this is about. Uh, Catherine is going to give us an update on where we are with the overall construction budget and, and how we got there. Uh, Greg Gossens, who is our project architect, is going to go over the scope of work as it's been defined now with the current budget and uh, you know, what kinds of functions are in the building. Uh, the business plan so far, we'll, I'll talk about where are we with um, tenants in the building and where are we in terms of the uh, financial forecast, uh, given what we know now and, and, and assumptions that have been made at this point. PCBs is a topic that's been in the news a lot lately, and we'll talk about that issue. Uh, we have on Zoom uh, Sarah Rate, who is with Two Rivers, Swatakichi Planning Agency. She's an expert in the uh, area of uh, PCBs and other toxic substances in buildings, and, and she will uh, have comments to say. We'll talk about risk and mitigation of this and other options. Uh, a couple of people talk about uh, choices as a community and then open it up to questions and answers and comments uh, from uh, anyone. And we have uh, wireless microphones that will be brought to your place. Uh, if you put your hand up and Dune will moderate that process. So next slide, please. So just for orientation, uh, because you're going to hear the term classroom wing, theater wing, 
This is the classroom wing we're talking about. This is where we've been uh, searching for tenants to occupy and pay for space in the building, primarily. And uh, here we are in the auditorium right now, and the shops over here. And uh, Greg, I think, is going to go back into talking about what kinds of functions would be where uh, in the building uh, when we get to that point. Next. I'm sorry, not yet. Go back, and I'll in bring uh, Catherine up. Oh, it is a good turnout. Thanks, everybody, for coming and for your interest. This is all in packs. <laughs> the town of Rochester, for sure. Um, so for those of you who don't know the history of this project so far, when the, uh, the high school closed down, there was a group of folks uh, who formed the, the Rochester High School Repurposing Committee. And the, f the first thing that we did was to uh, go through many in community engagement processes, including a workshop uh, that was modeled after the Vermont uh, Community uh, uh, Rural Development and uh, our Council on Rural Development. And uh, that brought us uh, $50,000 for a feasibility study that was conducted by Fair, uh, Peter uh, Fairweather and Greg Gossens, the architect of GBA Architecture. And that was presented to the public in July of 22. That presented us with a budget for phase one of construction, which came to 3.105 million. And that was the basis of what we submitted to the CDS uh, earmark under Senator Sanders. The first year that we submitted, we didn't get approved. The second year we submitted, we got approved. And in March of this year, we were awarded uh, $2,329,000, uh, passed into law in March 2024, and it is the money for to the town uh, dedicated to this project. Uh, the proposal that was the result of uh, community engagement workshops, focus groups, and surveys to meet community identified needs. And in and April, on April 29th, I think we held our first informational meeting at the town offices, and there was a significant number of people uh, online as well as in the office. There was a lot of enthusiasm. It was wonderful. Uh, one of the questions that came out of that first informational was, have you uh, updated your budget to meet the 2024-2025 uh, uh, costs of construction? Well, we had applied for, at that point, a $10,000 extension uh, for Greg Gossens, our, our architect, uh, to do some uh, feasibility study uh, work and uh, drawings, et cetera, and also update the budget. At the end of June, we got the budget update, which was a jaw-dropping additional $2 million because of the cost of the HVAC system and electrical panels. HVAC system alone went up to over a million dollars. So, uh, gee, taking us that long to get to $3,329,000, plus we got a very generous $300,000 uh, um, anonymous donation, but it was going to take us a while longer to come up with $2 million more. So we went back to Greg and said, Greg, we need to see what we can do with the USDA money. And that's what he did. And we are very happy with the results. We're still working within that three point, well, now it's up to five, 3.5. But we feel that it's doable. And as soon as we have a completed funding, our USDA money will flow. We are allowed to start spending the money that we have right now, which is basically the anonymous donation. And we also, and I'll talk about, or this will be talked about later, but we have formed a 501c3 called the Valley Hub Inc. And that is, if things are a go, uh, the purpose of that nonprofit, tax exempt nonprofit, will be to manage the building on behalf of the town. So we are accepting donations now. And anybody who is moved to donate to the VHI, talk to me afterwards, and I'll let you know how that's done. And it will be a tax exempt donation. So we're going to get into more detail with uh, Greg. And thank you. And thanks to Sarah and Gabby and everybody who contributed to our visual.
Okay, well, we can stay at this one for a little bit. Um, so, okay. So, um, when we um, got the adjusted numbers and needed to respond accordingly, the, you know, the first thing is, okay, we've got this. What can we, what can we do with that budget? You can't have everything. What can you do with that budget? So, is this pointer working? Okay. So, that wing, what we were calling the classroom wing, was where the really the meat of all the programmatic reuse spaces are going to go. They're, all the shaded spaces, for the most part, are people that have expressed interest of who want to be in the building. And that really is where the income is being produced, and it's really where all the public services are going to be produced. So the thing was to concentrate on that wing with the dollars that we have right now and to do as much as we can with this wing. So um, this one is basically going to be, just as we started, a gut rehab, all new mechanicals, all new electricals, um, all new insulation, weatherization, and the, and the like, lighting and all, and all of that, and fit up for this, for this space. This wing here is going to pretty much remain as is, except for right now within the uh, budget, we seem to have enough money to do the roof insulation and a new roof. Now, basically, the mechanical engineers who are working with us on this project are very in the net zero type um, construction. We also want to go all electric. The mantra is reduce the load. Before we design the system, reduce the load. And as anybody who's done insulation in their homes and the like, Cap insulation is the most effective insulation um, as your first step. Then you start dealing with windows and walls. So we want to at least get this part of the building with the cap insulation. So now we can get into the next slide. Is the mic working? Okay. So here's how we got the 3.5 million. So concentrating on the classroom wing plus the, uh, the roof on the other wing. We have, uh, and these are broken down by what we call um, kind of um, construction um, divisions. So those who are familiar with construction divisions will, will uh, be familiar with how this is presented. But basically, they go as a number, every division is a, like a scope of work. So the first one are, are general conditions. General conditions are what the contractor has to build the building. It's not their overhead but it's what they need to have to build the building, their insurance costs, their bonding costs. This is going to be a federally funded project that needs to be bonded. Um, and those things, they're, they're equipment that are project specific and the like. So that's $145,000. Civil um, site and demolition work, pretty modest on this project, but still added up to $125,000. There's no con new concrete, no new masonry, and no new metals. This building is really well built. We don't see, I mean, the, the bones of this building are excellent. So there's really no need to do any remediation work with that. Yeah, it was designed by a lot, so. Oh, yeah, well, the, when, we, when we got the job, everybody was saying this was designed by a down country architect who didn't know anything about Vermont. No, it was designed by a guy from Essex Junction. So. And we've got the drawings to prove it. So just to kind of, so, so the bones are good. <laughs> and the guy knew what he was doing. So, you know, all the time. So the next division is carpentry. And basically what we're doing on the classroom wing is we are going to do all exterior new stud walls, minor interior wall changes, and do accessibility changes. And the reason we're doing the exterior stud walls is so we can insulate. We're going to do insulation inside of the concrete block. There's no insulation in, in this building. There's concrete block and airspace and brick. So we're going to insulate on the inside of the shell. And then that gets into Division 7, which is thermal and moisture protection. Exterior wall insulation for the classroom wing. The big one is the roof insulation. We're basically going to be taking off the EPDM membrane roof putting four inches of rigid insulation on it, which meets the energy code. We're going to do an alternate bid for six inches of rigid insulation and put on a new roof membrane. So that, those are pretty big numbers. Openings, new windows. Right now, you have non-thermally broken aluminum single-pane windows in this building. Um, they're, they're, they're like Leak Master 2000s, if you want to label them. <laughs> like they're not great. So we're going to do all new windows and doors for the classroom wing. 
Um, finishes, pretty easy. Everything we have to do up here with um, carpentry, we have to repaint, and then there's just a fresh coat of paint on a lot of things. Specialties, we really don't have any specialties. We're not doing any equipment nor furnishings. Basically, the individual tenants will fit up their space when it comes to furnishings and equipment, but we're going to give them the bones. So here are the big ones. Mechanical and plumbing, and you can see there, we're going for an all-electric system. We're going to study. We have money in the budget to do a test well, at least one test well, to see if you have the water capacity to put geothermal in it. But the unassailable part is we're going to go uh, in a highly energy, energy efficient, all-electric building. And if we can make it geothermal, we're going to do it. And a lot of people say, why did it go up so much? And anybody who's done construction knows that basically Mechanical and electrical costs have basically skyrocketed in the last few years. And a lot of it is supply chain stuff. A lot of that equipment is really um, not available now. The labor costs have gone way up. Getting labor, I mean, right now, basically, um, skilled labor is really hard to come by. So the mechanical and electrical subcontractors are really struggling to find people to put on their job. And when they do find them, they're paying them well, which is great. We should all be paid well. I mean. This vow of poverty we take to live in Vermont's got to end somewhere along the line. <laughs> so, so, there, so there's those numbers right there. So there, you know, some nice, healthy, healthy numbers. But the engineer that we're working with is a very good engineer. And what they're going to do is they're going to design the entire building mechanical backbone and not do the distribution in the uh, auditorium and the, and the uh, shop wing to save money but they're going to build the backbone for the entire building for that budget. Electrical, since we're doing all electrical now, basically the biggest cost with the electrical costs, besides panels and switchboards, which have gone skyrocket, it costs also with that one, is um, we have to upgrade the electrical service. As the electrical engineer told me, this was bad service when the building was built. It wasn't good. So we have to upgrade the electrical service to the building to get it to accommodate all of the electrical, mechanical um, that we're going to put into it. Soft costs, fees, well investigation, permitting costs, legal, all that kind of stuff. That's what those all are. And right now, a very healthy contingency. At this phase in a project, we, we always ask and recommend that the owner carry at least about a 20% contingency on the, on the construction costs. And the way contingency works, it's there for the community's insurance. So if something comes up, you have money to cover it. And if you don't spend it as the project goes on, it either goes back into the bank or back into your budget, or you might be able, to, you might have alternates that you want to kind of, oh, if we had more money, we would do this. So it could be more of a discretionary spending. And how the projects work, we're in a feasibility stage now, so it's a 20% contingency. When we get into schematic design, we'll dial it down to a 15% contingency. When we get into design development, we'll take it down to a 10% contingency. And when it goes into construction on a rehab job, we'll go to a 7% contingency. So we dial those contingencies down as the project gets more defined. So that got us the 3.5 million. And that, it's a great project. It solves a lot of problems. And it, it's going to give you the, the real active part of the building for that budget. We're putting out a lot of information, and as I say, we'd like to hold on uh, questions and comments until after we get through presenting all the information. So we're not quite yet. Not yet. <laughs> That's great. Uh, eager mic runners. That's great. <laughs> Sue, next. Next slide, please. Okay, so this here's an, an exterior representation of what it might look like. Um, and you'll notice, uh, I just want to point out one thing, the second item from the top, potential photovoltaic, photovoltaic solar panels. Um, the, the goal is to, as Greg was saying, make the building <clears throat> all electric and net zero so that uh, minimize the, the cost of operating as well as not burning any fossil fuels. Okay, next. So Catherine mentioned the uh, creation of the nonprofit Valley Hub Inc. So this is a nonprofit that it was created for the purpose of supporting this project if it goes forward. 
Uh, we wanted to have a structure in place that could uh, manage the building on behalf of the owner, being that being the town, if that's the decision that's made. Um, it can uh, raise funds uh, on a tax exempt basis and uh, develop the program going forward. Uh, we know from earlier conversation with our major grant source that if the town accepts this project and goes forward with it and takes the, those funds, it would have to own the building uh, for five years minimum uh, before it could sell it to another party. So that's one reason why the five years uh, uh, would be the initial uh, period of managing the building on behalf of the town. After that, we, we'll, we would see where we are. Maybe it's a success, maybe it's not. We just don't know at this early stage, and so a decision would be made in the future about whether the town might wish to continue to own it or sell it to uh, the nonprofit to take it from there or shut it down. I mean, you know, there's no uh, way of really knowing what the future is going to hold. We'll, we'll do our best to put things in place to make it a success, but uh, this is a project that has risk to it, and it may or may not turn out to be the way that we hope it would be if we start. So we're, one other item, we're currently negotiating with a select board to create this management agreement for the uh, repurposed high school. So again, if it goes forward, uh, we want to have a way to take the burden off of the town uh, select board, the town staff, and have a separate group of volunteers, and eventually, if this continues to work, have a, a, a manager to deal with tenant issues and collect the rent and pay the bills and everything else that goes along with managing a, a building. Next. So I want to bring an update of here, where we are with finding tenants to occupy and pay uh, rent to support the operation of the building. We've talked to a number of uh, people who own businesses that would be compatible with this use, that would bring something valuable to the community, uh, respond uh, to identified needs that Catherine mentioned that were uh, explored a couple of years ago now, and uh, take sp specific amounts of space in the building. Uh, we uh, worked with an attorney to prepare a memorandum of understanding that would be prior to a lease should the project go forward. And uh, people have signed up for these amounts of space and totaling uh, for $73,000 approximately annual uh, income to the building. We then have also been in discussion with several, so let me just tick them off. So Hometown Physical Therapy, I think people know, Mayor Electronics, Hudson Solar, uh, Whimsical, which is a uh, sort of light production packaging uh, business that uh, uh, Walter is developing. The Penn Program, which is an alternate uh, education program for uh, junior high and high school age kids who don't fit into regular school, and uh, this is something that Andrew First, new teacher in our community, and has done before, and would like to be able to offer uh, again and do it here in Rochester. Um, we are working to bring an early childhood development center that is a daycare center with wraparound uh, social and health services that would be important to uh, children and young parents. And uh, uh, Maureen Young is uh, spearheading this planning process. It would require about 2,500 square feet. Uh, she's doing research on a grant and is applying for grants and is talking with operators uh, so that if this project goes forward, we would have an experienced operator not trying to do this ourselves. And that's really a theme for this whole project. So the VHI is a convening, looking for and convening providers of services to be in this building, to take advantage of it and bring their services to the town. But we're not the experts. We're looking for experts to do those things uh, on behalf of the town in the building. Quintown Senior Center would like to move here and expand their program. Green Mountain Suzuki Institute is already here. Uh, and we've been in conversation with the school board about uh, the elementary school students using parts of the building. Uh, there is sincere interest in doing that. It's being explored. Well, Catherine calls it an anchor tenant. Uh, so depending on how much space they are you know, interested in, it could be a real anchor to, uh, to the building. 
And then we have, uh, after all that, about uh, 4,000 square feet of, of remaining available space in the classroom wing uh, for lease. You know, we're looking for suitable for-profits as well as uh, non-profit service organizations. And we made an assumption that half that space gets leased and we made some uh, assumptions based on conversations about what the lease rate per uh, year would be per foot and have uh, numbers here, $73,000 in the first wave uh, and then $65,000 in the second wave of tenants coming into the building. Next, next slide. Okay, so here we have a five-year pro forma uh, profit and loss. Let me just uh, sort of orient you. Across the top is each fiscal year, starting with the year starting uh, this coming July 1, 2025, through the end of that year. This, if this project go forward and if we remain on schedule, the construction would take place during that year. And Greg has advised us that 10 to 14 months should be enough time to, to do this work, so pick 12 months. Uh, then each successive year after that, this would be the period of time if this uh, management agreement comes to fruition uh, that uh, we would be managing this uh, building. The revenue coming from uh, the tenant rents that I just described before, starting uh, in the year after the construction is completed and then going out increasing 2% a year. Uh, the other set of tenants starting a year later and then going out 2% uh, each year. User fees for organizations uh, like uh, the White River Valley Players or the users of the um, uh, shops or uh, other users of the building, we think that there's a potential income opportunity. It's not huge, but there's something there. And then donations. We think particularly if this project is approved for going forward, we could attract donations, at least in this first year. Um, future years, we're not sure. It's just too far out and too speculative at this point. So I want to concentrate on this first year for a, um, uh, for a moment, because this is the year, if this goes forward, where the school uh, board's support for this building will have ended, and there's no uh, tenant income yet coming into the building. So there would be a deficit terms of operating the building and uh, revenue coming in from other sources. And that deficit is estimated so far at about $75,000, say. Now, uh, there's a couple of potential sources where that might come from. One would be to, to uh, prepare and submit an appropriation for uh, approval at next uh, March's uh, annual town meeting. Um, it might also be possible to find donors who would be willing to contribute towards this if the project is a go. Um, and we could take a look at uh, getting a loan from a bank. Uh, so I think there's various ways in which we could address this. And then the final line I wanted to point out down here is we have as an alternative uh, the option to demolish the building. We have a proposal, and I think many of you are aware of it, uh, for about hundred and I'm sorry, about 1.7 million dollars, uh, which uh, works out to about 94 thousand dollars a year every year for 30 years in terms of repaying the, the loan uh, on that kind of money. So this bottom line indicates <laughs> what is the the outcome of the operation in comparison to that 94 thousand uh, dollar risk that's out there. And even with this size of a deficit, it's still better than $94,000. In the next year, uh, with tenancy in the building, that deficit goes down. And the years after that, it goes positive, and so it gets that much better. This is a pro forma. These are preliminary numbers. Uh, you know, these are not written in stone. Uh, this, this needs to be challenged, but this is the kind of thing uh, that uh, could uh, potentially happen. And we'll go back to this in Q&A if anybody would like to go into these in more detail. Next slide. OK, we have to talk about uh, PCBs. So just by way of orientation, polychlorinated biphenyls, uh, classic chemicals, 
found in a lot of building uh, materials, particularly in the period of time that this building was built. And as I think many, of, if not most of you already know, a lot of school buildings in Vermont are uh, examining uh, the extent to which they have or don't have PCB contamination in the building and what it's gonna take to deal with it. Um, <clears throat> a law was passed a couple of years ago which established uh, PCB air concentration thresholds for mitigation in schools. And our, if our conversations with the school board comes to fruition, it would, be, uh, it would result in having school children occupancy in the building. And so uh, along with that, it could trigger this Vermont X-74 requirement that these standards be met. This is, uh, you know, we're discovering all this in real time, so we don't have all the answers to this, but this is an issue we needed to put out there. And uh, there was an article recently that noted that uh, about a third of the schools that have been tested in Vermont have shown to have PCB levels that are uh, in need of mitigation. So it's a bit of a roll of dice. Uh, our plan right now is to have testing start this fall. It would take about four months, we're told, by Sarah Raitt from Two Rivers to complete the testing. And if the levels require mitigation, then to complete a mitigation plan as well. Yeah. And um, that obviously raises concerns because, as uh, Dune noted, we have our vote coming up on uh, November the 5th, but we won't know the answer to this PCB question until after that vote. So uh, there's a uh, conversation has begun with the school board about how do we address this, this concern about this timing mismatch. And let me ask if Sarah Raid is on the line and has something to add to this. Sarah, I know you're here if sure. you want to unmute. Hi, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear in the audience? Okay. Yep, you're good. Wonderful. Um, thanks, Vic. I think I would just add um, just a little bit of detail around what uh, testing has looked like so far. So um, when it comes to PCBs, we test the content of like actual building materials. Um, and we also look at PCB concentrations in indoor air. Those are the sort of two types of testing that we do to check for PCB contamination. Um, we have not done any indoor air testing in uh, the old high school to date. Instead, we have done um, some testing of construction materials. So I think it's worth noting the results that came out of that. That testing was done um, in late 2022, and uh, the entire building was, was tested. And, and the way that testing happens in these sort of early phases of material construction material testing is that we put together composite samples so we take um, little bits of for example um, plastic from different parts of the building and we we put those little chips of plastic into um, a single sample jar and then that gets sent off to the lab and we see if there's PCBs in there, and we record very carefully where those chips of plastic came from, but we can't test every square inch of every material in the building, right? So that's why we're putting together these composite representative samples of the building. So the results of that test from um, late 2022 was that um, most of the samples came back fine. There was no detection of PCBs in, in most of the samples that were taken. There were low concentration of PCBs found in um, two types of material. They found it in paint, and they found it in um, cove base adhesive. And cove base, if those, for those who aren't familiar, are basically those um, plastic strips that uh, sort of are cover the joint between the wall and the floor, right? So they, they make it kind of a nice little edging in that, the place where the wall and the floor meet. Um, and so the, the adhesive that's used to stick that to the wall that was sampled because you often find PCBs in there. Um, and so that was the other place that PCBs were found. And by low concentrations, I'm, I'm look, talking about just barely over one milligram per um, kilogram. That's how we sort of measure it within construction materials. And just for a point of reference, um, the action level 
the regulatory threshold within construction materials is 50 milligrams per kilogram. So the concentrations that were found in construction materials were very, very low, and they were only found in the classroom wing of the building. There were no PCBs found in the western wing of the building. That said, if, if school children are going to be um, in the building, then as Vic said, that will trigger Act 74 compliance under um, the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation's jurisdiction. And they are likely to require indoor air testing. Um, so it's not enough that we've tested the uh, construction materials because the problem with PCBs is that they off gas into the air. That's really the main point of contact that for most folks is because obviously most folks aren't, you know, taking the paint off the walls or they're not coming into contact with the adhesive. The problem is that those materials are off gassing PCBs into the air. So we don't know what the concentration of PCBs in the air um, are in the classroom ring at this point in time. And that's that's part of the investigation that would happen moving forward under the Act 74 compliance um, process. So I hope that helps to add just a little bit more context and I'm happy to answer any questions folks might have after the presentation. Thanks, Vic. Great, thank you, Sarah. Okay, next slide. Okay, well, spend a little bit of time talking about risk and mitigation. As I said before, this is not a project without risk. Um, and it could come in several forms. You know, if we don't get enough funding to complete the building, uh, we shouldn't really get started on, uh, so we would delay contracting and uh, occupancy until sufficient funds are committed. Uh, don't wanna have a half-built building. Um, what if we don't get enough tenants to cover the operating costs? Or if we've underestimated the operating costs? Uh, well, there may be several ways to deal with that, reducing the capital reserves, uh, increasing fundraising, go back to the town and, and ask for a subsidy. If the project is just deemed hopeless, um, you know, go on and do something else. I don't see that as being uh, likely, personally, but I think we have to be realistic about the potential for what could, what could go wrong. Uh, PCB contamination, if those, if those samples come back, and show that there's you know, substantial contamination and the cost of mitigation is way beyond anything that we could really bear, then you know, we might have to take a look at uh, whether this project can go forward or not or continue. Um, so those are risks and, and those are kinds of things we're trying to evaluate as we go forward. Uh, then there's these other risks, uh, demolition and abandonment, which uh, those are 100%, if, if that's the decision that's made, that's not a percentage of, you know, what's the risk percentage, that's, that means you know, a lot of money every year for 30 years uh, for generations. Uh, abandonment, uh, you know, creating a derelict building in the middle of town, which would likely require to be demolished at a future date, um, you really can't mitigate that if that's the direction that's taken. Next. So here's the outline. <laughs> there are many more steps than this, trust me. Uh, but these are sort of highlights of, of what's coming up over the course of the next year or so. The, um, so as we talked about it, the, the vote is on November 5th. And the rest of this schedule assumes that the uh, answer is yes. Um, if it's no, then, you know, this all stops. Uh, November, if the vote is yes, uh, we would be in a position to formally select architect and project manager by end of the month and get going on the design work and, and project organization that needs to happen. Uh, based on what we've uh, discussed so far with Sarah, we would expect a PCB report and received and evaluated around February. And then, uh, as uh, you know, Dune indicated, you know, if, if the decision is to go ahead, we, we would. If the decision is to not go ahead, then you know, things stop. Uh, March uh, town meeting, if we go to uh, the town with an appropriation request uh, to cover or help cover the operating cost deficit we expect in the first year, uh, that's a key decision point too for the town. By March, have design 80% ready uh, for construction documents. Uh, in April, we would file an application for a $1 million community development block grant implementation grant, 
which would be decided in June. And our uh, interactions with the agency staff were very, very positive. They are very strongly in favor of this uh, project going forward. And so we think we have a very good uh, uh, chance to get this kind of funding. It is competitive, uh, so uh, you know that's an issue too. By June, we would plan to have all the other funding in place for the $3.5 million phase one construction budget and plan as, as Catherine and Greg outlined. That would enable us to start construction in July, this coming July, and finish uh, about a year later and start moving tenants in and occupying the building. So let me, I think that's the last slide, is it not? Mm -hmm. It is. All right, so let me stop there and ask uh, Walter, he had a couple of comments he wanted to make, and then Asha. I'm gonna uh, wander over to a portable mic since. Uh, and introduce yourself with your both names. <laughs> um, many of you know me. Uh, I'll put my mouth close to the mic so I don't seem like I'm mumbling. And uh, because I can be long-winded, and I know this is uh, going to engender a lot of questions later, I wrote it out, so uh, I'll be brief. It's been a long discussion so far this evening and much more to come, and I'll be brief. To be exact, less than two minutes. Mine is a senior's perspective and one born of years of living and observing happenings in our valley. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Walter Gollop, and I've been a Rochester resident since 1967. I remain here because of the, con the community spirit, the friendliness, and the support exhibited by all its residents. Rochester is the heart of the Green Mountains and the center of the Quintown area. It's a community of families and individuals that supports its children senior residents, and frankly, all its residents. Most of us clearly remember how we came together during Hurricane Irene. Small businesses start here, they grow larger and more successful. But much has changed since our high school closed seven years ago. As a community, we miss rallying around our sports teams, the graduations on the green, school performance, band, and knowing where each of our children are all day long. By now, we are but now we're presented with the opportunity to decide on this generation's Rochester forward. As you'll note, this will add more than three seconds, but <clears throat> I'm not for repurposing, I'm for Rochester forward. That's, that's my term. In addition to selecting a president on November 5th, Rochester's being offered Dollar Day. The first step is a yes, no vote on, our, on November 5th. A yes vote signifies to our select board that the resident voters have decided to spend $1 to make this decision and return control of the process. A second vote will allow the choice of abandon, demolish, or continue to grow our town. Move Rochester forward. A no vote sig signifies that it is a select board decision, a school district decision, and not worth a dollar. Thanks for your time and your thoughtful consideration of this important decision. I hope I didn't speak too long. I wrote mine down too. <laughs> um, my name is Asha LaBeja Kennett. Um, I've lived here for the better part of 25 years. I moved here from the Boston area with my family and graduated from Rochester High School and then surprised myself by moving back. <laughs> um, I married into a business here in Rochester and now we're raising our four kids here. I was asked to speak and I'm very happy to speak um, representing my generation here in Rochester. 
Uh, Vic Catherine and the entire committee of exceptionally dedicated and knowledgeable community members have presented all of the facts and data proving this to be a viable project. Despite all that, it, it will take a leap of faith, um, a well-funded and well-researched <laughs> leap of faith, but faith nonetheless. We are not a unique community in many ways. Um, tax increases, inflation, all of that are being discussed, I'd argue, in every town in America. Multiple other towns in Vermont are dealing with their own empty high school and worrying their closure signaled the decline of their small communities. But we decided to live here and we are privileged to have this unique opportunity. If reading the mail outs and the website and hearing the committee speak, you still have reservations about this project, I encourage you to come to the school concerts and productions and see the standing room only audience supporting our local kids. Our school is bustling with life and with growth. Come to the local farmer's market and see our local innovative farmers, producers, bakers, talent. Talk to the families who come every week for the vibrance of this community and to enjoy Maya's library programs. Come to the talks, events, programs the library hosts year round. The skate space that's being completely revamped and has attracted heaps of kids for many years. Harvest Fair, the Players Productions, a 4th of July parade that even Bernie can't miss. PTO Bingo Night, Pierce Hall events, trick-or-treating night in town, and the early morning chats at the Skip Mart. If you have any doubt about whether or not our community can or is willing to take this on, come to these events. Talk to the multiple new families who have chosen this to be their forever home. Talk to the younger generation that hosts meetings to discuss our town's future and overwhelmingly is willing to take the risk and commit to this town and this community. We are not naive. We know it won't be easy, but the easier choice isn't often the best choice. We believe that in this case, the regret of inaction would be far greater than the regret of action. We choose to build upon the ambition of the generations before us that shaped Rochester in this truly unique town and community. We choose to listen to the facts and the research to embrace this challenge, acknowledge the possibility of failure, but not let that doubt and fear cloud our motivation. And we choose to commit to our Rochester's future. Please join us. Before we open it up to general question and answer and comments, I'd like to invite our representative Kirk White to come forward. He I think had something he wanted to say. Um, so I was in this building three weeks ago. Um, I came here with the Green Mountain Economic Development Corporation. Uh, I have been fighting hard for the last couple of years to get this project on the on the on the itinerary of the Green Mountain Economic Development Corporation they they rate different projects that they want to support in the state and this one just they did not want to put it on the list and so I, I put a lot of pressure on them and uh, and and now it is on the list so if you're community chooses to move forward, this is another resource that, that the state has available to help with the economic development side of, of putting this project together. And, but, so, but actually, I was not invited here to talk as your representative. Um, I was, when I was here, I was talking with Catherine, and she was going through the processes that, you know, and the, 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 the scary bits about this project. And, and I said, I completely, uh, I completely empathize with you because Bethel had some projects like this of our own. Um, you may recall that the Bethel Town Hall was derelict for a number of years. And, and our own community had these kinds of debates about whether or not we should fix it up, tear it down, or the popular opinion of our select board at the time was to just leave it alone and it'll fall down on its own. And, uh, and again, sort of the debate of 
demolishing it, which is going to cost a bunch of money, or letting it fall down on its own, which means eventually you're still going to have to pay some money eventually, the community eventually rallied toward, toward doing this project. And, and as I'm sure Vic and Catherine can, can, can tell you, it's a little bit like building the airplane while it's flying. Um, it's an ongoing process where you're always having to, to change and adapt and, oh, there's some new information now, and oh, now we have to do this. But, but that's the way these projects are. And um, any kind of innovative project that's going to move you forward in ways that aren't just sort of predestined, kind of managing the day-to-day, -day, which select boards are amazing at, um, uh, it, which is why I've never wanted to be on a select board, uh, you know, because that's a hard job. Uh, but, but these kind of projects do sort of require that, that ability to adapt, the ability to change, that always updating. And, uh, and I would like to say that, you know, Bethel, we got there. And it, and it wasn't a straight line. We got there. Um, what you'll find is that your funding sources, no one wants to, none of the big funding sources want to fund the beginning of a project. All the big grantors are waiting to be the last check you get because they get to go to the ribbon cutting ceremony. <laughs> And so, so keep at it. You know, I mean, your town can decide what you want to do. I just want to uh, just want to say that that it can work. It does work. Bethel now has this beautiful town hall uh, that has been used in so many ways that we didn't even anticipate. Uh, the state uses it for for their meetings there. There's uh, it became a bigger asset that, than we even imagined. And so. Um, if, if you have the, the will and the drive to dream, I say go for it. I'll turn it back over to Dune to moderate the meeting and speakers. Right. Would anyone possibly have a question? Well, that was easy. <laughs> I'm sure that um, some people have something they'd like to say. Um, I guess in, in lieu of someone else having something to say, I, I, will, I will say something. Um, so I've been, as you know, I, I like fixing up old buildings. You know, I usually like them older than this one. But um, um, I've gone back and forth um, several times on thinking, oh, what a crazy idea is like a two, how could we not do this? Because um, I love this town and I think that it deserves um, the, the trust and belief that we can continue to make it better. Um, the one just, just simply though, looking at the numbers of what it would cost on uh, an ongoing year after year after year basis to to finance demolishing the building, I, I think it makes much more sense to to take an initial hit for a couple years to for even less money to 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 um, renovate the building and then have an asset versus uh, another lawn that we have to pay someone to mow. Um, that's that's um, my feeling. I'm I'm for the project. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I, I did what you told me. I put. <laughs> I had a, a quick question. What happens if we vote no? If we vote no, I understand that the um, the school building stays in the um, in the control of the supervisory union. And um, one one interesting um, factor here is, and then Amy can speak to this also, but the. Um, the monies that have been raised so far are available to a municipality, but they're not available to a school district. So the money goes away. And um, Amy, do you want to answer that question? You're raising your hand. Yeah. Well, I guess I. Oh, sure. I'm kind of loud. But... Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, the one thing that I did want to clarify is that this building is actually owned by the Rochester Stockbridge School District. It is not owned by the overarching supervisory union. 
the um, expenses that have been needed to pay for the building are in our current budget, in our school budget, our Rochester Stockbridge tax is paid for that. Um, the building, so I just want to clarify that, but then the question is what happens with the no? Well, it needs to go back into, it goes back into the hand of the school board and then the school board has meetings to decide what they want to do with it. Um, the school does not have access to funds to be able to do any renovations. Um, probably doesn't even have access to funds to be able to demolish it. So we'd be coming back down to ask for a bond, possibly to demolish it. Um, there would be a lot of discussion that would need to happen, but this is owned by you guys and by Stockbridge right now. And what I really would like to say is that this is Rochester's building, and I think that it's time that Rochester decides what they want to do with it, takes responsibility for it, whether they want to repurpose it, whether they want to sell it, whether they want to demo it, whether they want to abandon it. it I think it really needs to be pulled back to Rochester taxpayers and take it off the school's um, tax, the school's budget of the Rochester Stockbridge taxpayers. So, uh, have you had discussions within the school board? Is there any kind of discussions or planning about what, beyond what you've just described here? So, um, Shar and I moved here about almost 10 years ago, and uh, it's a wonderful community. And, and everything that Aja said, I, I believe too, but when I was in business, I was always a worst case planner. And I was in a business where a lot of things could go wrong, and they often did. So when I look at a plan like this, to me, I see a lot of things that could go wrong. Uh, I, I think the optimism is very good. and. Uh, but one of the things that I did in this uh, community is, is serve on the budget uh, committee for two years. It's a, tight, it's a tight budget. What the town can do is very limited. So I would suggest that people in this town ask themselves three common sense questions. One, do we need this? Two, how good is this plan? How many ways are there that this plan could go wrong? And three, what do we do if it fails? Uh, Vic has, has, has mentioned that it could fail, and it, it can fail as all things in life. Uh, but I think this, this is a, any kind of responsible person, whether it's a family or a town, has to look at cold realities of money. Uh, and I think that should be done here. Thank you. I'd like being. to, uh, I just said, oh, wait, hold, oh. um, let's, Mason's got the mic first, and then you, Dane. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Uh, first off, it, it, this is all great, but maybe it's not the town that should be doing it. Maybe the state of Vermont should be the lead. And the school board, the two towns have a great asset. And that asset is five state senators. Kurt White has done some great work here, but we have five state senators who could go to the state and say, you should take this on and be the one, instead of having, as mentioned, the taxpayers of Rochester take on such a high liability. And the state may well want to have another training center available for state employees and lease it. So maybe we should expand this to look at it as a project that the state would want to take on using this plan and co cooperation with it. But, uh, uh, but the school board has more power here than we're looking at. Five state senators is a great lobbying organization. Thank you. 
Dane? Good evening. Good evening. All right, there you go. Ten four. Uh, Dane Cooley. I just had two questions, or one comment, one question. The uh, PCB would that impact on the demolition? Maybe the lady on the uh, web could uh, answer that. I'm not sure. Would that increase the cost if there was found to be uh, PCBs in the uh, school? Would that impact the demolition? And the other thing is, every day you get up, you got your pluses and minuses in businesses and in life. And uh, all it takes is confidence to succeed. And if you don't have that, you're not gonna succeed. So if we go into this with confidence, I, I think the best outcome will be achieved. Is, is Sarah Good still annoying? Sarah, still on? Did, Sarah, did you get that question about if uh, PCBs are found, would it increase the cost of demolition? Hi, yes, so um, if, if the plan was to demolish the building, um, I don't anticipate that PCBs would increase the demolition costs because at that point we're not concerned about indoor air quality, right? We're only concerned about the concentration of PCBs in the building materials themselves. And as I mentioned, they are so low that they're nowhere near um, the EPA regulatory thresholds for, um, for taking action for PCB contamination building materials. So you would not have to dispose of them in any um, special way. So I don't anticipate that uh, PCBs would increase the cost of demolition um, at all. Thank you. I would like to know um, exactly what the total money is that uh, Bernie Sanders got from the appropriation process and whether there was any commitment there or any condition there rather that the town raised a certain amount of money above that in order to get the grant. Who's speaking? Can you say your name, sir? Yeah, uh, Mike Van Dusen, 139 South Main Street. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not sure I got the total question, but you'll let me know if I haven't answered it. So of the, so we submitted to Senator Sanders uh, a budget of 3.105 million for Phase One construction cost, and. He granted, or the, he, he suggested to the Congress, which passed the bill, uh, and they gave us, in law, $2,329,000. So the difference between that and the 3.1 is our responsibility, our contribution. Now, I have just learned, and this is through the USDA Community Facilities Grant. So all of our preliminary costs are included in our match including the $10,000 um, extension from ACCD on our planning grant. So we got a 300, uh, just about a $300,000 anonymous donation, and we, which left us for, with about a $500,000 gap. So we submitted a, a CDBG grant for that, and we were told in June that our project wasn't complete enough. We still haven't gotten the FEMA standard certification on our floodplain mitigation because the do one of the doors had rotted and it takes time and I don't know whether that's been fixed. Vic, did, it's there, so it's just been fixed, so we'll be soon getting that. But uh, we, so they suggested that they would keep our application open and we could submit again on September 17th. So today is September 4th. But we learn in a conversation with Nathan Cleveland and, our, and Greg Gossens that there's so much competition now for this CDBG grant that instead of the project having to be shovel ready in six months, it has to be shovel ready in three months. And that's not gonna happen for this project. Greg needs more time to get the construction uh, design so forth. So 
It's, we're going to do it. We're going to submit our, our preliminary application in January. We're upping the request to a million dollars over our, what we first were asking for a hot 500,000. And we will get um, notification uh, in June. And that should still bring us right on target. It gives us a little bit more time. And we really don't see a disadvantage there. The, CD, uh, the congressionally directed spending, CDS money, will start to flow as soon as the, it's a completely uh, funded project. We're not funding a five point some million, we're funding the 3.5. We're feeling very confident that we're gonna be able to come up with that totality. So the CDS money will be flowing at the same time the CDBG money will be flowing. And meanwhile, as I said, we are now tax exempt and can accept another $300,000. <laughs> There's money up in them there hills. I know there is. So we'll be knocking on your door. But, but that tells me that we don't, we, the, the town is voting before they have the 3.5. The town has guaranteed the Sanders money. It is passed into law. It is the town's money. That's not going anywhere. And we have five years to spend that money. But we have to pursue development to spend that money. We can't get that money and spend it on demolition or, or some other thing. It was based on a proposal that was developed through community engagement. Um, so to answer your question, the, the CDS money is the town's money. That's not going away that it's up to us to meet the matching fund. And we're gonna do that. Uh, I think uh, Midge, you had the, you wanna speak? It's on now? Okay. Um, a lot has been said, uh, comments and everything, and I'm not sure just, just where to start. But to address Mason's um, bit about the group, um, the group that has been proposing the repurposing of the high school has been dealing with the bureaucracy of the state and the federal since the beginning. And if anything has held up this project, it has been that. So to even we may have great representation in this community, but this is not their project. And it would set it back probably 10 years if we could even keep it on. I mean, I'm just making up numbers, but the point is, is every time we've been ready to move ahead, there's been something else thrown at this committee that was totally unknown and unexpected, and it has to be addressed. And it's, it's a little bit um, chaotic. And so the group here has done tremendous amount of work for years to make sure that they get all the answers and get the information that they need. But um, this is not their project, is it? This is Rochester's project. And I don't see it going forward anywhere to try to turn it back over to the state. No matter, you know, theoretically they might be interested. They're not gonna do it, in my opinion. To address what Rob was saying about businesses and whatnot, um, even with all the risk that we all take when we have a business, we usually, we, we keep going because there's something that we believe in and we feel like we have a lot invested in it. But you, you carried through with a lot of tremendous projects and were very successful at it. And a lot of that had to do with the, the teams that you had in place and your own ingenuity and talent. And we have a lot of talent here. We have a lot of motivation and um, a lot of desire to move this town forward. There is, as Asha was saying, there is a younger generation coming up um, that so wants to have for their families what we had for ours and why we all came here and settled here. There isn't a person who didn't feel like they benefited 
from living here. Um, we were talking about the other day. Everybody talks about how they got here. And everybody says, it was the best thing. No regrets. So we take that inspiration and we pass it on to the younger generation who this will benefit. And I feel like they need our help and we need their help to move this town into a new era and to, to support them. Um, the project is going to cost money. There's no question about it. If you tear the building down, it's going to cost us money, a lot of money, for 30 years. And as it's been pointed out, the, what has been on here, it will cost us more money to tear the building down for 30 years than it will for us to put, advance it and fix it up and move it forward. So it seems to me that that is not really an option for us because why would we want to pay $95,000 every year for nothing? and then have to pay to have it mowed on top of that. So, you know, it's, that doesn't even include the mowing. So anyway, that's my two cents on this, and um, I really think this is a good meeting. Hi. Hi. Hannah Rice, born and raised in Rochester. Um, I just had a question about, we're talking all these really big numbers that are super intimidating, but I didn't know if there was an update about how much with the length of the of the time we have to pay it off and the values of our homes, do we have an estimate of what our taxes would go up per household or a number kind of like that so that we're not dealing with really big, scary numbers personally? Yeah, we um, met with a budget committee a year ago, maybe two years ago now to get at that. What's the rate? So at that time, the estimate of a deficit was $60,000 and uh, that would mean it's like it's a dollar per thousand um, uh, dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for sixty dollars, be sixty dollars per hundred thousand dollars of assessed value. So if you have a property that's the average in Rochester is about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, somewhere in that range, assessed value. So sixty dollars per hundred. So sixty times two point five is one hundred and fifty dollars a year, in a year. Um, preach? No, no. Hi. Oh. Uh, oh, never mind. Okay. Burma first. Hi, thank you. I have a question about the town's long-term debt and how that is going to affect how we come up with money to support this project before it starts bringing in an income. And I'm also very concerned about the PCB testing and not having the results and expecting the vote for people to vote before they really know what's going on. It doesn't feel right to me. I don't see how you can vote for something if you don't know what's going on. So what triggered the um, Act 64 are the ongoing discussions we are having with the Rochester Stockbridge School District Board about the school becoming an anchor tenant in this wing of the building. They still haven't made a firm decision on it. They'll be meeting on September 9th, so we can't speak to anything definite about anything. But we're hoping, because having them as an anchor tenant will fulfill one of the aspirations that we had, was to get students back into this building and to be using this wing of the building for their, to expand on their curriculum. And the school board was very excited about that idea, but there's no definitive decision. We know from talking to Sarah that should the school become an anchor tenant, which would answer a lot of questions in terms of sustainability because it would bring in a very good, uh, you know, piece of money, right? A regular piece of money to, uh, to all the expenses on the building. Uh, it triggers the, uh, the uh, PCB testing. So I listened to what Sarah said. I'm not going to get worried about it. We're also talked just as recently as 3 o'clock today 
to the superintendent and to Amy uh, about some possibilities of, uh, of how we could possibly deal with that. And again, if I could talk to ab about it definitively, which we will on the next informational before you vote, which is October 29th, we will bring this information to you, okay? We will say what, what is being suggested if there's an opt-out or, or if there's a contingency, whatever there is. We will talk about that in definitive terms. But tonight, we can't because it's always like things are happening in real time, building the, you know, building the airplane as you're in the air. That is what we're doing. But we hear you. We hear, we've been hearing ever since that, uh, you know, the recent Vermont Digger article is out. People have legitimate concerns. Spoke to uh, Kurt about it. I think even the legislature is having some legitimate concerns about Act 74 because we don't have the money to really implement it across the school district, let alone in a section like this. So, you know, this is not just our problem. This is a state problem. And I believe that the legislature has got to deal with it because you can't mandate schools to do something that they don't have the money to do and then expect to have a vibrant school system in a very small state. You just can't do it. So have a little faith that you know, it is all going to get worked out and, stop, and don't be so afraid. Um, we, we, we definitely hear people want an opt out. Okay, that has been heard loud and clear that some horrible, horrible revelation happens. So we're thinking about that, we're working with them, we're seeing how that's gonna be designed, where the school is not also, because we are the biggest town in a two-town district. So the school district isn't also holding this basket. Do you know what I'm saying? We don't escape from it. Rochester doesn't escape from it. We are in the school district and we're the town, so. Hi, my name is Larry Creech. My main concern is that it, the plans all seem very nice and everything looks like a lot of people have put a huge amount of work into this. My main concern, and if I understand this correctly, are we going to find out about the toxins before or after the vote? I can only say one concern that I've been watching on TV is the Burlington High School District was re is redoing their school. And they put a project number of three million. And then what happened was they found more toxins than they thought and it's up to six million. So I'm not trying to throw cold water on anything, but can we really vote on something that we don't have all the answers to? Thank you. I think by October 29th, we will be able to stand here and tell you more specific information. Should you vote to acquire the building, should the PCB testing happen with the worst possible results, what your options going to be before you cast your vote on November 5th. That is our goal right now. So yes, nobody wants to get stuck with a huge multi-million dollar mitigation process. Right? Uh, I, can't, I can't give you an answer, but I certainly understand your concern, and we're working to resolve that. Let me, let me just add. If I could just add to that. So, I think as Dune said at the outset, the vote on November 5 is whether the town takes control of the building or not. It is not per se to go ahead and, and commit the funds to, to develop the building with the grant. And in fact, where is it here? Rest is, uh, yeah. So February, we received the report, and at that point, the town could decide, we ain't doing it. So, um, so there is still an out. Even if, if, even if the vote is taken on November 5, and we don't know the definitive answer on the PCB report until months later, uh, the schedule calls for the town to retain the right to, to not go forward, to tell Senator Sanders, no thanks, we're not doing it. I want you to keep in mind that this is the PCB testing is triggered only by having the school as the anchor tenant. So we also have the option to not accept that, except that it would be regrettable. 
And the other thing is the danger in PCBs, as what I, from what I've been reading, is long-term exposure. So it's one thing to be a kid in a classroom all day long, five days a week. It's another thing for a kid to come in once a month, twice a month, twice a week to have art programming in this wing of the building, which nothing was found in this building in the PCB testing that was earlier. Remember that. We're going to have more aggressive testing because that's what DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, will demand of us. But there's every reason to think that this will go well, too. And you will know, not the results of the testing, but you will know whether you have an option to opt out once you acquire. That's, I think that's the real thing that people want to know, is that if we acquire and then we get the worst information, do we have to go through with a purchase and sale agreement? I think that is the question that we put out today. And that's got to be discussed. But there's also the option of simply not having the school as the anchor tenant. Then you don't have to go through with the PCB testing. I don't want to breathe the PCBs either. But um, we've got um, Sarah Wright is on Zoom that would um, yeah, she's like to the speak. Expert. Yeah, Sarah. Thank you. I just wanted to add just a, a couple more words. Um, one is that the, as I understand it, there is a plan to have daycare in the classroom building, and so there is value to investigating PCBs. I think even if. Um, the district is not an anchor tenant. I do want to sort of address the concern about remediation costs. So remediation costs are scary. And um, in terms of testing, our office has grant funding to help cover the cost of testing and to cover the cost of um, putting together a plan to remediate any contamination problems that are, are you know, exceeding regulatory thresholds. After that, there's sort of a different flavor of funding in the Brownfields world that's called cleanup funding. And so the town would have, let's imagine that you're in a scenario where, okay, you do actually have to take some action and mitigate some PCBs. Then you could, there are places you could go to apply for funding to clean up PCBs specifically, to clean up the problems on the property. So the state has a couple pots of money which currently are oversubscribed, but by the time we get to February, that situation may well change. We'll be in a new fiscal year. So, um, so it's possible you might be able to apply to some state pots of money. Um, and then also there are cleanup grants through EPA. So if you are facing, um, heaven forbid, a very large price tag um, for remediation of PCBs, you could apply to for an EPA cleanup grant. There's never any guarantees when you apply for grants. Um, but I just want to make sure that folks are aware that there are options for funding um, cleanups of contamination on these kinds of properties. Amy? Just a quick comment. Um, there is a lot of renovations that are going to be happening in this building. There's, correct, new windows. Um, I assume they're probably going to paint the walls, um, which maybe is where a PCB was found. So I'm wondering, there's potential for some of the PCBs to go away when we're actually replacing and doing construction. Just a thought to put out there. I'd like to answer uh, Burma's question. The town's uh, debt service is 2.6 million. We pay 150,000 a year in the, on the debt service. In the next five years, it's anticipated to go even higher due to the fact we have to replace some trucks in the, in the fleet. And on top of that, if you did demolish the school, it would add another 94000 a year to that debt service. But we're going to be probably increasing that debt service with the purchase of vehicles in the next couple of years. Plus, we have the buildings. We're going through the capital plan at this point, which is looking kind of scary with everything that's coming up. <laughs> Uh, as far as repairs to buildings and what we do with those buildings and how we address them. And so that's going to be a real hit in the long-term debt also. And we can't get away from that. So this is going to add a little more to it. If that's the case, they go through with this. Um, I don't know what else to tell you. There's just a, it's, there's no good end here. There really isn't. Um, I think I have the microphone, Larry Strauss. Um, so 
So I did have one question. Did I understand the architect to say that they're just going to be uh, possibly just a roof improvement to the auditorium wing? But if, if the, isn't the, the area that the school was most interested in leasing the um, uh, multi-purpose room, shop, and auditorium, so the area that's not going to be addressed with renovation it, it, isn't that the portion that the school was most interested in leasing? Um, yeah, it, I'm not sure which specific area of this wing. I mean, there have been uh, several parts of it have been discussed, whether it's the auditorium or the band room or or the shops. Uh, that's you know up for discussion within the school system itself in terms of their curriculum. So I don't know if we can definitively say whether kids would be present in this room versus that room or that room at this point. But, but, but the design, your, your concept plan is that the school wouldn't, is not most interested in leasing the classroom portion, Correct. that's the other tenants. Right. But so, but the, so the, Using the budgeted money that you currently have, you're concentrating that money on the classroom portion. Correct. That's yeah. right. So the, but and by default, the other portion that the school might be interested in is not being disturbed. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other part of this wing, I think, and Greg, correct me if I'm wrong. It's it's the roof, right? The roof would be replaced, and that's you know outside of the box of the room. Uh, but no. but I would like to go back. But um, yeah, point made. Also, we are using this room now. I I, I, I do I <laughs> At do this see, very moment. <laughs> I I do see that, but it's going to lack of the efficiency improvements of yeah. the other, right? But. I mean, eventually, I suppose there would be some drive to make those future improvements. Yeah. Um, but on, so, on a, on a separate note, I um, my my overall feeling on this is that um, I feel that there is a basic question of fairness, um, uh, as as Amy's somewhat touched on. Um, you know that you know th this should be brought back. Um, you know, with a yes vote uh, uh, to be a Rochester question, um, and you know, wh wh whatever may flow from the spending of, of of that dollar, and perhaps it will turn out that it's contingent on the results of the PCB testing. That's a, you know, that a new wrinkle that was thrown into the mix. You know, and, um, and I'm sure there'll be others, um, but. Um, I, I, I feel that um, it's the right thing to do to uh, bring the decision, you know, back to the town of Rochester. Um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that the project as outlined here or as known here um, is, is what's going to end up happening. But I think the school board... Um, has only really one choice, and that's to abandon the building. Whereas there's multiple choices, you know, by saying yes, the town taking ownership, and and then, you know, let the select board and maybe the voters in some fashion, you know, weigh in on what eventually happens after that. Um, Mary had her hand up. I'm not much better with microphones than anybody else. Uh, my name is Mary Frutini. I'm generally speaking in agreement with what um, Larry just said. The one thing I would add is that the part of the way I'm thinking about this is not should we purchase the building or not, um, because we already own it, right? As one of the two, as one of two school um, towns in a school district, the school district might be the legal owner of the building, but we are one half of that entity. So um, we, we, are res we are responsible for this building, whether it has PCBs, whether it doesn't. Like, like 
we already own the building in some respect. Um, and so the cost of, ab of abandoning it, of that we're already spending to simply maintain it in our school budgets, um, we are spending the money already. Um, so my own particular orientation towards this question is it is a simple yes or no vote in November, which is to say yes, do we want to continue to own this building as part of the Rochester Stockbridge Unified School District? Or do we want to own this building as a town and be able to make the decisions about what we want to do with this building as a town? Um, so I'm in agreement with Larry. I just come at it in a slightly different way. Dane? Another question for Sarah on the PCBs. Do they dissipate or do they grow stronger? Because this building's 50 years old and plenty of kids here, went to school here for a long time. We're here right now. Uh, do they dissipate or do they get stronger? And uh, that's what. Did you hear that, Sarah? Yes, thank you. Um, so I am not enough of an expert to answer that question definitively. I'm so sorry. I know that um, PCB, PCB off-gassing can um, increase in speed and intensity um, when materials are disturbed. So it's possible that during renovation and also with the change in airflow in the building, we could end up with differences in concentrations of, of PCBs. And so the sampling plan that would be put together would try to account for that as best as possible. Um, but in terms of like off gassing over time, I also suspect that it depends on the material in question and the, the concentration of PCBs in that specific material. And that's, that's something that um, I, I suspect you would have to be a very highly specialized materials scientist to, to know exactly how the off-gassing rates change for every different specific material. And I, my impression from talking to our consultants who are out in the field doing that testing is that um, it is hard to, it's hard to predict. And so it's important to get a sense of exactly where the PCB off-gassing materials are and then work from there to, to eliminate those sources. Um, and then that will have a resulting beneficial impact for air quality. The concern about PCBs in building materials largely stems from the fact that PCBs will actually bleed into the surrounding um, materials that didn't originally have PCBs in them, and then they start to off-gas from the surrounding materials. So whether or not that process of bleeding actually increases the volume of PCBs that are going out into the air, I don't know, but I do know that that transfer process happens. So typically when we remove PCBs from a building, it also involves removing some of the material that were in contact with the, um, with the contaminated materials. I hope that helps a little bit. I'm sorry I'm not able to provide a more detailed answer. Uh, I wanted to respond to what Midge suggested, which is that uh, in my life, uh, I, I produced many things that were dependent on optimism and faith, belief that something would happen, that grant would come in, it would, it would work, it would work. Well, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it crashes and burns. And I just see a lot of optimism shown on this plan. To me, this is a huge, expensive, complicated project, a massive project. And, and to be honest with you, I, I, I love this town. But I think the town is financially fragile. I, I think that I don't think people are paying attention to how fragile the town is with the limits. The real limits of the town are, and we can we can charge off with enthusiasm and faith and optimism into something, and damage the town. And I I, I know that I, I know I'm raining on everybody's parade, but I've had this personal experience happening to me. And sometimes faith carries you through, and sometimes. It does not. Can I ask, um, is the assumption of the select board that this is the plan, that we vote yes, and then this is the plan to be implemented? This is um, an option. This is a significant option. But like we said, the, um, 
the unfolding of what the testing with the PCBs does. So it's no, it's not, um, it's not set in stone. But mm -hmm. this is the uh, most logical, you know, the most thought out and developed plan that's out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, we have over. Yep. Dick. Hello. I'm Dick Robson. Um, I just want to bring to mind uh, when we're talking about risks, um, there's a huge risk of this town becoming a smaller, older town. That if we talk about the town's indebtedness, there, if we don't take on a project like this to build the community, to give young families a reason to be here, to give our students a reason to stay here, it's going to become a smaller town with the same amount of debt to pay. So this is a community building project. It has a risk. But not doing this project I think has a bigger risk. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm Robert Mayer. Um, I'm reminded something you said um, to me, Rob, uh, and other people several years ago. You were talking about we, we need to do things that attract people to the the, the town. Um, our younger townspeople who are the, the type of person who would come to the town uh, have spoken of what, what their needs are. And this is the, this plan here is something that addresses their needs. Um, if we don't do this plan, I would challenge this, the uh, select board to have some, uh, some alternate plan. I don't see any alternate plan on the horizon. So, you know, we're in any case, whether or not the town does it or the school school does it, you know, it's it's either do something with this place or demolish it. We know either way we're talking about a, a bond to tear this thing down. So, you know, those you know, it's it seems foolish not to try it. Because in the at the end we haven't spent millions because we're being funded by grants, so the, what we are risking is what the cost of maintaining this place for two years um, is, and not for the cost of renovating where we have grants we've we've landed grants for the for the renovation. So what at the end of it if it if the project doesn't go then you can still tear the place down and you're only down a couple hundred thousand spread over several years. I don't think I agree with that. Right? Well, I mean, we, you saw the, the estimates in the spreadsheet and, and they were not, I mean, we're not talking about uh, the, the town risking millions of dollars because we've already, already landed the grants. We still have some more landing to do, as, but it's not a huge amount. We're, not a huge amount compared to the overall project. So, you know, what we, we are risking, but we're not risking the cost of the, over, the whole project. We're risking a, a, a fraction of it. And then at in the end of the day, you can st if, if the experiment is not successful, you can always tear the place down. Or sell it. Or sell it. Or sell it. <laughs> and it, it'll be mu a renovated building will be much more attractive to sell. Yeah. I just want to say that we've already received grants. Up to this point, we've had the $60,000 in the planning grant. We've had almost $100,000 in funding towards the round fields, uh, what's called the Brella uh, environmental assessment. We cleared both phase one and phase two of that. We've also had uh, committee-based money uh, to paying for the attorney to uh, develop the 501c3. We've had that this hasn't cost the town any money. This is the, we paid, we contributed towards the heat. 
of, of, of the, the building with the $12,000 and another $15,000. So, I mean, we're doing it, and we haven't come to the town and asked you for a penny. So, I just, I know because I know the commitment of the people who've been working on it, and I also understand that you have to do the work and not get too attached to the results. The results are in the voters' hands, and I do trust the wisdom of our select board. Okay, great. Uh, just two quick questions. Um, oh, I'm Drew Hudson. I live with Mary uh, here in Rochester, who are relatively recent transplants. Uh, two quick questions on the, the funding side. One, I'm really excited to see that we're moving to an all-electric system for heating and things. One, that'll save the town a lot of money going forward, or whoever is operating the building. It's much cheaper to heat electric than with fuel oil uh, in the future, and especially if we make uh, efficiency improvements, insulation and all that. Um, have we pursued any funding from the U.S. Department of Energy uh, or from the Inflation Reduction Act, both of which have money specifically for municipalities to do renovations to switch systems to electric from heating oil, and second question, um, have we done anything like an economic impact analysis? A lot of what we've been talking about is there's an upside to doing all this renovation. There's jobs that will be created doing the renovation work. There's also new businesses that will be created. I'm one of the people who signed an MOU with a thing that doesn't exist yet, but I'm willing to pay rent and move a business into town and hire people and be part of the community. If the high school project doesn't go forward, maybe I'll move over to the next to Bethel and put it in the town hall or something. But there, there is a cost, what we keep saying, to if you don't make the space available, then businesses by necessity can't move in and develop and grow there. So has anybody done an economic impact analysis or something like that to look at what's the upside of renovating the facility and then having all those new daycare centers and healthcare centers and things in the property? In answer specifically to your question, in the feasibility study, there was aspects of that done, but in terms of the, a specific uh, economic impact, no. We'd love for you to join us and work <laughs> that good. Okay, and I think for a lot of these, the money, we have to go to the one to the next step to own. Every granting or funder that we have dealt with now has been working with us and giving money based on the you know, the probability that the town uh, is gonna acquire the building because it's all been done in the name of the town. So it's the, it's the town that signed the dotted line for, for the grants. And I'd love for you to join us, really. Over here. Hello, oh, I'm Andrew Fersh. I am one of those uh, newer transplants I will not have the audacity to say that I'm a young new transplant, but um, talking about, I'm going to jump back to the optimism part. So I am an educator, uh, teach in the district, have taught for 15 years. And in education, you have to look at it as what is the best that could happen. Um, and while I understand that that is not the world of business, I also very firmly believe that if we're not looking at our lives and the lives of our children. I have a four-year-old who's in the district. Um, then we have not, we've done a disservice to them. And so yes, I, I fully see that there are, are questions and concerns and they're all very valid. Uh, to me, as someone who has actually worked in a renovated high school that was turned into a community center uh, in a community about the same size as the Quintown area. Um, I know what it can do for a community. And I think, you know, a huge part of the reason, uh, there are a million reasons my family moved here for our forever home. Uh, and, and one of them was this work. It was the inspiration of the fact that there are people who've spent years working towards doing something that I really firmly believe um, would benefit a huge number of people. And to me, that means that a risk um, is not as, as important as the potential reward. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, Burma wants to talk. Hi, I, I think it's amazing and phenomenal what the committee has accomplished. I mean, it, it is just an enormous project, and I, I know it has been very challenging. My question is, when the town takes over, who's going to run it? I mean, who in the town offices is going to be owning the, the building, and how is that going to work? I, I, I just don't understand how that, that's going to happen. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why we created Valley Hub Inc. was to provide an operator for the building in contract with the town. So there would be clear lines of responsibility and accountability for managing the building. And, in, and they would start off with volunteer work. Uh, I don't know if Walter is still here or not, but he volunteered to be the building manager and then they will paint the building if we get that far. Um, and eventually we would hire a, uh, a, a building manager uh, to do that. It wouldn't be a part-time job, but it is built into the budget to start, I think, in year three, if you saw the pro forma. And that would be overseen by the board um, it, with accountability to the town. So one of our goals in this process, if it goes forward, is to minimize to the extent possible added burden to the town staff and select board. Uh, we know it's a big undertaking. And that's why also, uh, we, if, if this goes forward, again, there's always that if, um, in five years' time would be an opportunity to pull back and say, should the town continue to own it, or should the town hand it off to another party, whether it's VHI or another uh, entity? Um, but, but your question is, is uh, very pertinent, Burma, that uh, this is a big, complicated project. It's a big building. Having multiple tenants is a complicated thing to manage, you know, whether it's dealing complaints or plumbing problems or you know getting the electrician in when you need them uh, so yes it would it would not be on the shoulders of of uh, cooter <laughs> to handle this in the back here hi i'm a piper weeks i'm 15 i've lived here forever and I wanted to touch up on the optimistic thing. I also agree that stuff can go wrong, but it is gonna cost money either way, so we can either invest that into tearing it down and letting it sit empty, or building something that could potentially bring more people in, that could help our economy more than just an empty lot. So I believe that it's a good investment. Mason's got his hand up over there. Um, I was interested in, um, uh, does the parking lot belong to the school board or will the parking lot belong to the town? What is the boundaries? And how much has the select board viewed the floodplain issue as the owners of this building if we vote yes? So to your question about the floodplain and the floodway. So I think we were about two years into this project when we met with Grace Vinson, who said, well, wait a second. What? Oh, State Environmental Office. Uh, she works in ACCD. She said, oh, but uh, the property is located in the floodway and the floodplain, and that's a no-go. So that was a big hurdle. and. Uh, with the help of Dick Robson, uh, we uh, started work on it. We discovered that the, 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 the difference between the flood way is that's the natural path of the river. The flood plain is where water comes and stands. So during Irene, it entered the building right through here, right? So with a property boundary adjustment, we were able to remove the high school property out of the flood way. So it was just a little sliver that was in the floodway, and that's gone with the, uh, the boundary adjustment. And the floodplain, we, uh, 
worked with uh, Dubois King engineers. They came and they did an assessment. They, they presented their proposals. There were three of them to the school board, who was who the owner of the property. Uh, and they made a decision on uh, which uh, a mitigation uh, solution they wanted to go with. And that was installed. Um, and they paid for it. <laughs> Floodgates. Have you ever been to Vienna? This is what they use, and it floods regularly there in, Ven in Venice. It goes in, in Venice. Slots right yeah. There. And there were new doors installed right. down below underneath the thing. There were only two places at which that we had to really do the mitigation here and in the back of the building. The door was rotted, so that door had to be replaced. But I was in Venice when it flooded, and this is, this is the solution those shopkeepers do, use, and that floods on a regular basis. So uh, we've passed those hurdles. To your second question, I can't remember what it was. Oh, the parking lot. So I think the, the high school, the parking lot, which is on our part of the boundary, is the, the high schools, but the, the elementary school also has an easement to use it. So I think that's the answer to that question. Paving? Wow, that will be discussed, Mason. We'll put it on our list. Uh, one one issue about the floodplain is in the um, the uh, investigation and um, problem solving about what could happen with this building. The proximity to the floodway and being in the floodplain um, cut out any option of housing being a purpose for this and be receiving any any. Um, federal monies for that they just that would be a no-go but the uh, monies are able to flow for the purposes that that we've that the sites have been set up on you pay it <laughs> <laughs> I mean, specifically how the insurance works, I, I, I don't know what the policies are here, but that's, um, it would be, um, it's, it's probably, yeah, it's insured right now through the, the school, but it would that got, be part of the- uh, that, I got an initial yeah. estimate just for budgeting purposes from the same insurance agent that we use at uh, Werva, and it was ten to $12,000 annual premium, uh, depending on your deductible, and there's a maximum coverage. It's through the government program. It's it's either 350 or 500 thousand um, uh, dollars. And I know Patty's looking into other options through uh, Vermont Council or cities and towns to see if that would be a less expensive way to get it. So there's coverage out there. It's limited, um, and the you know the cost is in the 10 to 12 thousand dollar range. Is what we've found so far per year. Uh, we have someone on Zoom that's got a hand raised here. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, my name is Jana Murray Swedick, and I just wanted to say that, first of all, I so appreciate, I think so many people do, all the work that Catherine and Vic and everybody else has put into researching and doing an enormous amount of, of work on this and for, you know, for the sake of our whole town. And I feel like... Um, we have such a wonderful town here, and so many people are so creative and have so many things to offer, and so many new families have moved here, and it's just such a cohesive place for everybody. And I feel like we're at a uh, sort of a fork in the road right now where we can choose to be positive. Um, we can choose amazing opportunity for our town and open doors to all sorts of amazing other things, or we can be negative um, and then be left with just more debt to have to tear down a building. And I feel like the fact that we have this grant that's a huge amount of money. Um, if, we we if we turn down this opportunity, then we lose that money for our town. It's like an opportunity gift for our town. If we turn that down, then we're just left with tear down and debt. So I'm highly in favor of it, and I think it's, it's an amazing opportunity given all the work that has been put um, in place to basically get grant work money to cover most of it. Thank you. To clarify the 
the grant that we were getting, um, I, I'm not sure this was mentioned this time around, uh, the, the application was $3,105,000. Um, what we were granted was 75% of that request. And we are required to come up with 25% match so people can understand why we need more money. We have, we have to come up with $700,000 in matching funds. Um, we have uh, donors that have, that have helped to bridge that gap. Um, and now as time goes by and we keep delaying votes, the, the, the price tag just keeps going up and up and up. So um, that's why we're looking to uh, ask for another grant from the state, federal money through the state for another million dollars to cover the inflation of it all. Um, my question to <laughs> Catherine and Vic, um, when you apply for the grant for the $1 million in next April, um, is, that, is that grant going to be decided on a uh, do or die, yes or no, or would there be a compromise there? They say, like, okay, uh, we can't give you a million, but we could give you 750. So that's a good question, and um, because I already started the process of the CDBG in gears, everything we ask for has to be accounted for. It's broken out and broken out and broken out. It's not an easy grant. Um, but as, as uh, Greg Gossens pointed out, we're starting a process thinking that this is our budget, and our budget could, in fact, change again, go up or go down or whatever. So. I'm going to be looking to Greg to plug in those numbers in the CDBG grant. If they don't come to a million dollars, they're not going to say, well, why don't you have this extra 300,000? That's not the way it's going to work. It's all got to justify out in the numbers. Uh, now, I'm glad you brought this up, though, because the CDS money is federal money, right? And we can, we can use the CDBG grant to match that federal money because it's one step removed from federal. Northern Borders Regional Commission is another grant that we're going to go after. But they have an 80% or 85% federal cap. So we can't ask for the full ask out of them for this project. We can, we can use a component of this project that we haven't really addressed in the Sanders money uh, for, for Northern Borders. And that's why we're really seriously looking at building out the Early Childhood Center with more money from federal money. But in terms of what we've already stated our phase one construction is, I can't include that in the northern borders, except for like 5% or something. If you're looking for a grant, check Catherine first. <laughs> Yeah, all of the funders have different requirements, different regulations, uh, different start dates, end dates. Thank God, you know, the Sanders money is ours for five years. So. Um, well, this is, um, this is just yet another informational meeting. We're going to do it again before we have a vote, and so there'll be more questions and more information and, and, more, and answers. more answers too i hope <laughs> yep. um so if unless anyone else has um anything they they want to ask or contribute i'd um oh there we, we go have printouts on your way out with frequently at, we have printouts at the exits on the tables for frequently asked questions and well, other info sheets so okay. please take one as you exit the building all right. So um, thank you all for um, coming out and um, living in this wonderful town. Yeah. Yeah.